Evans hands off to Harper. Nothing there, but he looks wide and gets ahead for about three yards. Don, it's interesting to note they haven't featured Walter Payton in their first drive of the ball game. They're letting Vince Evans do the things early in the game that he did late against the Cleveland Browns when they were very effective. If you can take a little heat off Walter Payton, you're liable to see him run forever. This is the first time I've seen Chicago in the past three or four ball games use the rest of the players on the field. Harper three three carries for 19 yards this early in the ball game. That's using everybody. And now they come out of the huddle with a third down and seven coming up. Wide receiver set wide to the right, James Scott. Bash Nagel's also in the game, so is Ricky Watts. Three wide receivers on a third and seven. Evans with a deep drop. Remember, he can run it very well. Here he goes inside the 35-yard line. He was tripped up, coming across to knock him down, and barely getting him was big Mike Stinsrud, number 67. Actually, when Vince Evans came out of USC, he was projected as a running back in the NFL. A lot of people thought he'd go to Canada because he insisted on playing quarterback. Yeah, the funny thing is they had predetermined what they thought he would be best at. He was having none of it, and that's the reason he's playing quarterback right now, Don. I think that a quality of a quarterback is to, is to know what it is you're going to do when you get into the ball game. He would have none of that running back flanker stuff. He's come on. He's come on well as a quarterback. On that particular play... He slipped. He, he could have picked up the first down. Stensrud made a, a fine defensive effort. Soldier Field in Chicago. Chicago Bears with the ball. Their first possession. They're driving. This is fourth down, though. Fourth and three. Evans throws. He's got a man open. Walter Payton is stripped to the ball. Robert Brazil got there and hit him. Robert Brazil, a teammate of Walter Payton at Jackson State. Two all pros meet. The ball is separated, and Houston takes over the football with no score on the board and 10.43 to play first quarter. It'll be interesting for those at home. The Houston fans will, will wonder how they got away without getting a penalty flag thrown, but it looks to me as if Brazil has not put his arm... Well, you all make your own judgment. He may have tapped him on the helmet a little before the ball got there, but chalk up one for the good guys if you're a Houston fan. Brazil is credited with the fine defensive breakup. Here's another look. Now let's take a look. If he makes contact, and it looked as if he did there on Payton in the, in the headgear, it would have been a penalty, but the official didn't see it that way. It's first and 10, Houston. Oilers first and 10 at their 33. And uh, first back through is the fullback, Tim Wilson. Usually a blocker, he gets the first carry, and Tim Wilson takes it across the 35-yard line, out to the 38. Stabler at quarterback, Wilson the blocking back, although he was the runner there in the great Earl Campbell, over 1,000 yards already this year. Dave Casper is starting at tight end. There was some question about him. He has a hamstring pull. Billy Johnson and Renfro are the wide receivers, though about 90% of the time, the Oilers are in a two-tight end formation. They are right now with Barber and, and Casper as the tight ends. Second down and five. One yard per carry average is 1,094 yards coming into the game. He takes it ahead to the 40. It'll be third down. Dan Hampton, Jim Osborne, Alan Page, and Mike Hartenstein, the defensive front. They've sacked quarterbacks 35 times, lead the NFL. Muck and Sturm, Hicks, and Campbell back the line for Chicago. Got some hitters back in that secondary. Schmidt and Ellis at the corners. Fensick and Plank, the safeties, who like to play the run. yards to go for the first down for Houston. No score in the first quarter. Stabler. Good timing pattern. Gets it out to Ronnie Coleman, but we'll have to see if he got far enough. He had to get out across the 43-yard line of Houston. Where they set that ball, it looks like he made it by six or eight inches. I mean, it gets to be a hairline job with every exchange of the ball. And yeah, this is going to be by the nose of the football if he has it. Final score in. Los Angeles Rams beat New England 17-14. Rams coming from behind Elvis Peacock and a one-yard touchdown run. So after that, in the Buffalo victory at Cincinnati, the Bills take over first place in the AFC East with a 9-3 record, 8-3 record. Who'd have thunk it, huh? <laughs> they just keep playing good football. And the Steelers came from behind today to beat the Cleveland Browns. They get the first down to the Houston Oilers. It's going to be interesting, Don, throughout the course of, of the first half to see what the two tight end formation does to the, to the bare backfield. Their intention is to, is to force people to play in certain stereotyped ways. They would prefer to run the ball against, against the cornerbacks rather than the free safety and the strong safety. Fensick and, and 
flank are such good force men. They're going to try and force the cornerbacks to do that. That's a lot of the reason for them. Here's a first and ten throw to Barber and Stabler is right there at the 50. A gain of about eight yards on the play. The Oilers coming in here under Bum Phillips with four straight victories. They were three and three before the Earl started to roll and Casper came in to play tight end. Somebody said the Oilers are raiderized. Bum, so that sounds like we were sprayed with a bug repellent. And they got some good players from Oakland. And right now they're at top. Have a chance to take sole possession of first place. Look at that shot from Chopper 5, WMAQ Television in Chicago. Don't jump. Hope they've got a rope. High above Soldier Field. It's second down and about two now. Second back through is Campbell. He crashes ahead, gets a first down for the Oilers down to the 46-yard line of the Bears. Gary Campbell knocked him down, 59, outside linebacker. I rather expect, Don, that when they do run the ball straight ahead and all their all their offensive linemen just pick off whoever happens to be in the position, they let Tim Wilson pick off the force man and let Earl pick his hole. I think more than in the past, they'll run the ball toward the middle of the field because Alan Page has been having a great year. If he has one vulnerability, it would be that he is about 225 pounds and he can be moved if you run straight at him. Now it's first and 10 for Houston at the 46-yard line of Chicago. Fake the pitch, go to the fullback. Wilson doesn't get much going up the middle, but he does come inside the Chicago 45-yard line down to the 44. On a first down carry, he got a couple. 7.53 left to play in the first quarter. No score on the board. Bears move well their first possession, but then on a fourth down try with two yards to go, they fail to complete a pass. Houston Oilers now driving it out to the 45-yard line of Chicago. Oilers with a power formation. Dave Casper, the ghost, set tight end to the left. Mike Barber, leading receiver, tight end to the right. Stabler stands in, lets her rip. There's a man open. Casper goes for the ball but can't get to it. Going to bring up third down and eight for Houston. The Snake has 17 interceptions this year, seven touchdown passes. And you'd say, uh, well, hey, he's just throwing the ball short. That's the personality of the Houston Oilers. He's got two fine receivers, but he puts them in the right spot more than any other quarterback in the game. Gary Campbell made an outstanding play that time. He was one-on-one -on -one with Casper, forces a third and nine situation. Stabler's had interception problems in two games, primarily five against Pittsburgh in the opener and five in a loss to Seattle. But when he's hot, he's really something. He was hot Monday night. Here's a throw and a strike. Casper loses the ball. His two tight ends running crisscross patterns. It's a little timing job. He looked for Barber deep, then comes to Casper underneath, put the ball where it had to be thrown. One of the few times you'll see David come up without the football when it hits him. He's down there talking to Joe Bugle, his offensive coordinator. They put together some sort of offense. Cliff Parsley standing back at his 41 yard line. Lenny Walters shot to return the punt to the Bears. High spiral. That should carry into the end zone. Good angle. It almost went out inside the five, but it does skip into the end zone for a touchback. A 45 yard punt by Cliff Parsley. But it comes out to the 20, and the Bears go on offense for a second time. So it's 7 08. Left to play in the first quarter at Soldier Field. It is Houston nothing and Chicago nothing. Stands in. Oilers coming after him. Here's a strike on the far flank out to the 32-yard line. A first down throw to Brian Bashnagel. J.C. Wilson drives him out of bounds. Now let's go back to New York and to Brian Gumbel. Brian? Thank you, Don. At Mile High Stadium in Denver, the Jets have moved ahead of the Broncos. Richard Todd working from... ...to go after connecting on the third down throw. Vince Evans to Brian Bashnagel. And that's the reason I'm talking about a Vince Evans with a good arm. Hit the man right on the break. He and Bashnagel have been hitting each other pretty regular in the last three, four weeks. And uh, having that kind of an arm sure helps your offense. Here's Bull Harper, the fullback, getting the call. The Oilers give him nothing. Canard, the middle guard, 71, came across. Daryl Hunt, Oklahoma linebacker. Number 50 was also there. So is Robert Brazil. Five players who've made all pro from Jackson State in this game. Richard Castor, he made all pro first team with the New York Jets. Leon Gray, the left tackle for the Oilers. Robert Brazil, he's been all pro four times in six years in the league. Walter Payton's been all pro every year. 
Vernon Perry, one of the free safeties playing for Houston, made all pro two years in Canada. And of course, he had that great season a year ago, particularly that great playoff game against San Diego when he had a season against them, four interceptions in one game. Second down and seven. Evans stands in. Let's her rip. He's got his tight end. This is the rookie, Bob Fisher. Fisher takes it across the 50-yard line and down to the 45. Don, when you're throwing, when you're throwing the ball on second down and six, that's a personality trait that Chicago hasn't exposed until late. I love, the, I love the way that Evans is in there. He's running play action passes on first down, second down, and third down. He's hanging in there. We had a chance to watch Ken Kennard, number 71. Dan Neal took him originally. Nobody got in the face of, of Evans, allowed him to throw the ball. When you're doing it on first and second down, it just works out to where you have more time to throw. And he's been throwing it on the mark. Vince Evans now three for six for 43 yards as the Bears move the ball again. Their second possession. There's no score in the first quarter. First down and 10, Chicago, 46 yard line of Houston. Hand off. Here's Walter Payton. Look at him dance. Look at Walter Payton go inside the 40. Not done yet till he's down to the 45 yard line. The 35. He's got a first down for the Bears. His old pal Vernon Perry hit him out of bounds again. And you'll note that the only man close to the play was J.C. Wilson. When you when you are putting some pressure on the on the defensive line by throwing the ball on first down with play action passes, they get a little I don't knowish. And in this case, you didn't see anybody get across the offensive line of scrimmage defensively. It forces a guy like Wilson to make plays he doesn't want to make. They had no force, man. He was a little late getting there. And the game was good for 12 yards and another Chicago first down. So the Bears start to challenge again. Now they're inside the 35-yard line. First down and 10, Chicago. Bash Nagel slowly in motion. He'll be a blocker if they come this way. They go the other way, and they go to Walter Payton again, who's ahead for two yards. Daryl Hunt again was the striker for Houston. He is some hitter, Daryl Hunt, number 50, in the second year from Oklahoma. Consensus All-American for the Sooners. And the ball is down to the 33-yard line. I think it's pretty wise on Chicago's part to come out firing the ball around, start the game as if you were behind. Now, Chicago has always had Walter Payton, and they seem to play ball control offense. They haven't done that today, but when they have used Walter, that's the first time he hasn't been effective. Uh, they know that, that, that the Oilers' run defense is outstanding. They're going to have to show they can do something else. Payton's only 5 for 24 yards so far, but that didn't do bad early. Second down and eight now. As the Oilers go to extra defensive backs, Hunt, Washington go out of the game. Vince Evans throws. He's got his man running high with the ball. And coming down is Ricky Watts. He's inside the 25-yard line. Again, they've used Boschnagel, Roland Harper, Watts, Fisher, Payton. They've used five receivers already in the ball game. The first quarter still has three minutes, some odd seconds to go. That was another second down throw. You don't see that much in the past. They're giving Houston fits with it. They really are. Evans with a great dimension, his ability to run. He grades out in the 60s in that quarterback rating system, but that's really due to the fact he's come into some games when the Bears were behind. He had a pass a lot. When he started games, he grades up almost to 90. This is his fifth start. He's two and two as a starter this year. Handoff goes to Bull Harper, and Roland Harper tries to drive ahead of the Oilers' defensive nicely. Kennard, the middle guard, Andy Doris was also on the play. And Robert Brazil is in on just about every play, 52. This is the second time the Bears have moved the ball when they've had it in the first quarter. They came out with nothing. If they come out with the donut again, you can see the whole momentum of the ball game change. How many times when you get a few breaks early, if you don't capitalize, do things change? Almost every time. And the Bears certainly have moved the ball well their first two possessions. We now have 225 left to play in the first quarter. Kenny Stabler, quarterback Oakland, to a couple of wins recent years over the Chicago Bears when he was at the Raiders. Bears had trouble defending him. Most everyone does. Here's the handoff. Straight ahead they go to Walter Payton on second down and eight. He drives the ball down to the 18-yard line. On the tackle for Houston was Greg Bingham. Inside linebacker from Purdue, number 54. There's been Oilers leading tackler the last couple of years. 48 to go in the first quarter. Neil Armstrong under the pressure from the local press to a degree, but the ownership and management here says he's not under any pressure. He's going to be back. We got a good coach. They look totally different offensively than I've seen him in the past couple years, and I mean better. The 
they do. They've got a lot of diversity in their offense to the Bears. Now they have four wide receivers deployed on third down and a long four. Evans stands in. He throws way long into the end zone. It's intercepted. Superior play by Jack Tatum, his sixth interception of the season. And a lot of times, you'll see Jack Tatum make interceptions because of the position they're putting him in. That when they go to a five-back defensive backfield, they allow Jack Tatum to roam where he likes to roam. He's been extremely effective since he's come to Houston. They really give him a lot of freedom. In Oakland, they didn't give him so much, all right? He wasn't suited for their defensive style. In, in Houston, he's perfect. Well, he was perfect there, right on the play, and Jack Tatum, even though he's a backup, comes down in passing yardage. The an extra back leads the Oilers in interceptions. He's one of the leaders in the NFL with six. So the Bears... With John Brody, this is Don Crickey back at Soldier Field in Chicago. Houston Oilers with the ball for a second time. At their 20, after the Jack Tatum interception in the end zone that stopped a good Chicago drive. Staber on first down, dropping to throw. He's got a problem. He becomes the Chicago Bears 36th sack of the season. Jim Osborne is probably the most underrated player in the Chicago team gets him. Well, whenever you see a team that has a lot of sacks done, you see all four interior linemen having a good year. Jim Osborne was single teamed that time. However, on the other side, Alan Page was doubled up by both Bob Young. Carl Mock chose to go to the left side. It allowed Osborne to be one-on-one -on -one with the guard. When he was, he was very effective. Ed Fisher couldn't handle him alone. He got to Stabler, and now it's a long way out of the hole. It's all the way back to the 10-yard line. Brings up second down and 20. The snake goes to the run, and Earl Campbell, he'll break the long one. If he can get through that first line, he did, but the Bears came up. Made the stop at the 17-yard line. Jerry Muckensturm, 58, hit him. So now that brings up third long yardage for Houston. The ball is out to the Oilers, 17. No score with 38 seconds on the clock running in the first quarter. We saw Earl looking over to the, to the bench because in third and passing situations, he generally is, is relieved. They've got Rob Carpenter, who is an excellent pass receiver as a fullback. They use him a lot in this sort of situation. They also give Earl a chance to rest. to throw on third and 13. The snake stands in, hums a long one. He's going to be intercepted. Ball is taken at the 47-yard line by Doug Plank. The Ohio Stater brings the ball back inside the 35-yard line. And Doug Plank is down to the 31. And the Bears get it right back in the best field position they've started from. Alan Page put the heat on the snake. Alan Page should be given credit for the interception. The snake didn't want to go down there. He didn't see the man standing deep in center field. It's good pass surge. You can see all three of them. They're giving Stabler nowhere to go. Look at the outsides. He's got to step up. He's got to throw before he's ready. Alan Page forced the whole play. He's trying to go to White Shoes. There's nobody he can, he can get it to easily except the man in the blue. Doug Plank makes his first interception, a very big one, as he takes the ball back to the 32-yard line of Houston. Now, with five seconds to play in the first quarter, the Chicago Bears have it first and ten. They go to Walter Payton, and he's right up the middle down to the 26-yard line. Payton got five. The Snake looking things over is... 18th interception of the season might have set Chicago up for the first score of this game. We'll find out as the first quarter has just come to an end here at Soldier Field. Bum Phillips' his team on a four-game roll. Back at Chicago with the second quarter ready to get underway. Don Crickey with John Brody as the Chicago Bears, after an interception by Doug Plank, have the ball down at the 26-yard line, second down and five. No score in the game. Vince Evans goes to Harper, his fullback. Working behind those big blockers on the left side, Noah Jackson, Dan Neal, the center, and Ted Albrecht, the left tackle. And the carry is down inside the 25-yard line. Ken Kennard, the middle guard, made the knockdown for Houston. But it's going to bring up third down and only about a yard for the first down for the Bears. And it's funny how with certain football teams, as, as is true with Chicago, your defense picks off an interception and your offensive line starts moving off the ball, moving the defense back. And you'll notice this is the first time they've given it to Peyton twice in a row. He's picked up eight and a half yards and two carries. I, I credit it to the interception. It was a big one. There's been an interception each way in this game. Now Vince Evans sees something he doesn't like and uses one of his three timeouts. So Vince Evans comes over to talk to Coach Armstrong. Check things out. Well, a lot of times you see a, a quarterback call a timeout, and it's because he's confused. But there are other times where you expect a certain defense, you don't get it, you have a certain play call, and that's the only alternative you have. 
break of the action 14 18 left to play in the first half still no score on the board but the Chicago Bears are threatening right now it'll be third down and one when we resume play but right now we're going to switch to NFL 80 in New York and Brian Gumbel Brian Thank you, Don. While you're taking that time, Soldier Field, we have the Chicago Bears with third down and about a yard coming up here, John. What do you look for? Well, I look for an offensive surge. They're going to give the ball to Walter. This time they decoy Walter, and they go to the fullback, Harper, but they get the first down. And you'll note they've gone to their left side. Their offensive line is moving off the ball. Ted Albrecht has been a stalwart for them over the past four or five years. He's matched up with Elvin Bethay. It's no, it's no easy matchup, but you need to get a good block from your offensive tackle. It allows Walter Payton to get through at the point of attack, help him double team on Elvin Bethay, giving Harper a chance to pick up the first down easily. Harper's been getting some work, too. He's seven carries now for 32 yards. First and 10 Bears, 19-yard line of Houston. And down he goes to the 16-yard line. They're really coming up the ball nicely. A free agent center, Dan Neal. The ball carrier stopped by Thundering out Rose. along with that big 275-pound left guard. They call Buddha Noah Jackson, 6'1", 275. Offensively done, I think they've been a step ahead of Houston. However, they haven't turned any of their movement into, into points. Uh, we mentioned last time it would be a good idea if they got some points on the board. They've had it down there twice, this now being their third time. They started with everybody. Now they're back to Peyton. Second down and six. Harper, cutting back. Look at him power his way down to the 12-yard line. Coming up to make the tackle was Ted Thompson in the game. Carriers 51. And Greg Bingham was also on the stop. So Harper's been getting the ball often. And it's a long two yards. Might be a little more than two, but uh, this is certainly not an automatic run situation. Unless on fourth down and less than a yard, they intend to go for the seven. Uh, I don't think they would early in the ball game. They'd take the points any way they could get them. I expect them to throw the ball. If there's anything open outside, look for it to come home. They have a lot of plays in their offense, the Bears, where Evans calls his own number to run. This time he goes to Peyton, who just dives over the top. He's going to be close to a first down, but he might not have gotten there. Felt like he did. Well, you're just relying on the offensive line in a situation like that, Don. You see Noah Jackson, they, they love to go over him in Albrecht. They've got a fine offensive line right down the line. Dan Neal, number 52. Double team to the left side. Hope we get enough surge to let Sweetness pick up the first down. They end up about a foot and a half short. Credit the defense of the Oilers. So now the Bears assess their options. Their place kicker, Bob Thomas, has had a little bit of a slump lately. They're going to take another timeout with 11.53 left to play in the first half. Chicago takes a second timeout. Coach Armstrong wants to send a play into Evans personally. <laughs> Nothing on the board yet. We'll be back in a moment. More to smile about in a minute. If the Bears can put up some points, they have a big down coming up, and here comes the field goal unit to the dismay of the crowd. Done to the dismay of the crowd, but I'm in total agreement because if on fourth down and a long yard to go for a first down, they have no points on the board. Houston has to be as hard as anybody to run the ball against. You know when they went for a third and three running play, they thought they'd get closer than a yard if they didn't pick up the first down. Then they would have gone for it on fourth. A yard is too long in a short yarded situation with no score. Distance no problem as Bashnagel holds and Bob Thomas puts it up and good, but there is a penalty marker down. Let's wait and see what this is now. Referee Bob Frederick's going to check things out. Penalty marker went down on the play, but it's in the Houston Oilers secondary. Apparently the points are going to go on the board. I don't understand that. If it's not, it depends on the penalty, but if they yeah, could have got right. a first down if that penalty was... But no penalty was called, apparently. All right. One of these drop flags. <laughs> Whatever. 11.50 left to play in the first half. We'll be back at Lynn, Chicago. The lights are on at this historic ball yard, and 11.50 shows on the second quarter clock as the Bears have taken the lead on a 27-yard field goal by Bob Thomas. And Houston should feel very fortunate that the score is only 3 to nothing. The Bears have had the ball three times in scoring position. Three points to show for it uh, is not enough. Houston's hard to get the ball down there on. And yep, 
Grove is back with Kyle Roaches for the kickoff. Thomas sends a spinner down, not too deep. Here's Roaches at the 13. 20. Across the 25, across the 30, and Roaches is all the way out to the 37 yard line. Chris Haynes comes down on special teams, number 83, to make the play. Well, Chris Haynes made the statement that he was going to stop Roaches, and uh, he did, but I think he'd prefer to stop him inside the 20 rather than inside the 40. Roaches has come on fast since that marriage of his. We saw him play down in, uh, in the Astrodome the day after he got married. He had, he had his lumps, but uh, since that time, he's come on strong. Dropped the ball regularly that day, but he's been a great return man. Was working on a dairy truck a year ago. Came to the Oilers as a free agent. Pitch back to Campbell. And the Earl of Tyler loses his footing trying to cut back. The amazing thing, one of them about players like Campbell and his counterpart with Chicago, Walter Payton, is their durability pounding they take and week in and week out they're there. Let's recall also Don you know early in this ball game we have not seen them run the ball wide very often now having been down on the field before the game that turf is very slippery and it makes it a little tough for the offensive lineman to pull and lead that time as Campbell started to cut back there was a hole but when you slip you're going to come up without it. Campbell looking to become the first player in league history to win the rushing title his first three years. Billy Sims with 128 yards today is over a thousand for the season. Here goes Campbell. Look out. First down inside the 50. And he takes people with him right down to the 40 yard line. So Campbell busts the long gainer. Gary Fenza gets him a 22 yard gain on the play. Another passing situation. Houston's got that luxury. Second and 12 is not necessarily a throwing down. Early in the year we saw Stabler with this group throwing the ball second 12 throwing the ball whenever it was a normal passing down he changed his viewpoint about that and since that time Campbell's been the workhorse and effectively they've been they've been scoring the ball at will. Gary Fensick met Mr. Campbell head out and came out second. He goes out Lenny Wallershot goes in Campbell now has 35 yards and five carries. The Bears lead the game three nothing in the second quarter 10 17 to play in it. Stabler's been intercepted once, so has Ben Evans of the Bears. Stabler looking to throw. Here's a flat pass to Mike Barber. This big guy bolts down inside the 30 to the 27-yard line. Walterscheid knocked him out of bounds. Monday night, Barber went 79 yards with the reception. He's big, but he's also fast. He was a track man at Louisiana Tech, a hurdler and a quarter miler. Those two tight ends, Don, put so much of a burden on the linebackers. That time, Buckensturm has to watch Campbell. He can't let him run free against a defensive lineman. That's how a hole was created the play before. That time, he just gave Barber enough room to the outside to allow Stabler to throw a play pass. The linebackers are in a bind when you're playing Houston. Hot, hot, hot. Stabler does a great job play faking. This time, he goes to the run. To Campbell on a first down carry from the Bears' 27-yard line. Campbell gets it down inside at 23. Coach Armstrong had this to say about Earl Campbell. Runs like a Mack truck going downhill out of control without a driver. I think maybe Fensick would agree with him. Fensick must have felt like he's out in the freeway track on a semi. Fensick is back in the game now. Gary Fensick, fifth year from Yale. Free agent. Not too many number ones come out of Yale. Not in football. He won't go in industry. Here's a handoff to Campbell on second down and eight. He gets down inside the 20. Tom Hicks, the middle linebacker, has missed a couple of games with a shoulder problem. Back in number 54, made the hit. And the Oilers are getting down close now. They're well within Fritz's field goal range, and he has been sensational. This season, Tony Fritch, 14 of 15 field goals. He's hit on. 904 to play in the first half. Oilers have run about 70% of the time since they got Casper to the left side. They've got Casper aligned on the left with all pro Leon Gray and Big Bob Young, the left guard. And Mock, the center, is really a good one. Here's a handoff. They go the other way. Look at you. <laughs> Plank hits him, but you pay when you hit the Earl. This time, Campbell's a little slow getting up. Burn right, he's hurt. Tell you, Motown's made a fine block hit. Fisher helped him. Campbell's had three holes at the point of attack. This is something you very rarely see when Earl Campbell gets a, gets a surge at the, at the point of attack. He usually punishes the defensive backs. This time, it worked the other way. 
So with 8.35 left to go in the first half, Earl Campbell is attended to with Chicago. John, here's Earl on the sideline. We're going to watch again now the play we've shaken up on. Well, this is such a good lesson for all you young running backs. This is something that Earl very seldom is caught doing. He leaves the air, leaves the ground, goes over Motown. When your legs are in the air, you have no control of your situation. He got hit right on the thigh. His knee turned a little bit. He looks pretty healthy now, but that was a pretty good look, lick he took. Thigh, his knee turned a little bit. He looks pretty healthy now, but that was a pretty good look, lick he took. He took a hard shot, but it is a first down for the Houston Oilers and Stabler. From the Bear 13, throws the ball. Looked like it might have been tipped by Hartenstein. Alan Page was also on the play. We're looking at Renfro, Mike Renfro, wide receiver. That'll bring up second down and 10 for the Oilers at the Bear 13-yard line. 8.09 to play in the first half, and the Bears in the lead. 3 to nothing on a 27-yard field goal by Bob Thomas. Stabler's 3 for 7 for 22 yards, was intercepted one time. His last time out against the New England Patriots in that win, he was 15 for 17. Only one ball hit the ground. He was intercepted once. That's right. Now, Earl Campbell is not in the backfield at this time. They've got Rob Carpenter there. I think it's a certain throwing down. And that is the case as Stabler has a problem. Then they go call a grounding play. Well, Dan Hampton's complaining. I think he has reason too. Sure it is. But I tell you what, the rules being instituted the way they were, Don, the referee who is sitting back there watching the quarterback to make sure that he's protecting him cannot also put his attention down the field and figure out whether the quarterback threw the ball away intentionally or just didn't have enough eyesight to hit who he was aiming at. All the marginal calls go on the side of the quarterback. That's why it's wise when you get trapped to fire that thing into an open space. As you aptly put it one time, getting rid of the ball and you're in trouble isn't grounding, it's an art. You got it. Stabler's pretty good at it. <laughs> Third down and ten now for the Oilers. They're booing in Chicago. The Oilers looking for the pass again. Stabler stands in. Sings it down low. Coming across on the play was Rob Carpenter. Knocked down a tight end at the line. Here comes the field goal unit of the Houston Oilers. Just to show you what sort of respect the Oilers have for the pass rush of the Bears, this man is supposed to be a receiver. They're keeping Mike Barber in. They know Hampton is a tough man one-on-one. -on -one. Look at him. He's grabbing. He's doing everything they can. Most of the complaints so far throughout the National Football League have been by the defensive lineman trying to get to the quarterback. Another way to protect old QB. Be a 30-yard attempt for Tony French. He hasn't missed a miss distance yet this year. In fact, he's only missed one long one. What does he have here? He missed. Hit the upright and it went to the wrong side for the Oilers. So the Bears stop Houston. Houston driving downfield comes up empty with 7.54 left to play in the first half. It's UMAQ's News Chapter 5. Gives us the aerial view. Soldier Field, 1927, the site of the Dempsey Tunney fight. 1927. Notre Dame played USC before 123,000 in this game. Stadium. Here's a handoff to Peyton. A free ball. Look at that big shootout. Took off on Walter. Oh, my. That was a... I'll tell you, somebody else that took off was the guy holding that yardage stick down there on the 20-yard on the line. He got hit by Greg Bingham, who was in pursuit of the ball. Didn't even see him. Knocked him sprawling. But... Okay, there you go, Robert Brazil. You notice he's trying to force Peyton to the outside. When Peyton lost that ball, he was long gone. He was good for another 15 to 20 yards, but without the ball, you've got to go start over. Kind of gave it the little Pele shot there. Got it with his heel. 7.48 to play in the first half. A loss of almost four yards on the play. Call it second down at 14. Vince Evans back at his 16-yard line. Takes the deep drop. Stands in, has time, loops it up. Gets it to Walter Payton. He knows what to do with it. Payton fighting and crashing and driving. Gets the ball all the way across the 25-yard line, and he brings this sold-out stadium up. How many times, Don, when you see a great player make a bad play, does he come back the next play and make an exceptional one? This time, Payton had just lost his group four yards when it looked like he could make a certain 10. Little delay pass. Evans comes to him, makes a fine catch of the ball, and when he does, if you can get a man like Walter Payton out with the football, in the open field, it's Katie bar the door. You see five Oilers have a shot at him. They finally collectively bring him down. 
Tyler Payton, who's a sure bet one day to join us, such other Bears as Bulldog Turner and Sid Luckman, Gail Sayers in the Hall of Fame. Gets the big gainer. It's now going to be third down and three. And they go right back to Payton. Walter Payton breaks it, and Payton's ahead for a first down with his amazing strength for his 205 pounds of weight. Walter Payton cuts through the Houston defense and gets the ball out to the 41 yard line. Be a halfback. 12 yard gain on that play. <laughs> Must have taken a chisel. They, he does look like a like a regular statue. About as well built as any player that's ever played this game, and his his health has been so excellent. Missed one game in his six seasons. Back when he was a rookie. He said they held him out. He could have gone. He was ready. Rocco Moore now goes in at left guard, replacing Noah Jackson as Vince Evans on first down. Let's the home run ball go. Ricky Watts going for it. So is Reinfeld. Watts has the ball. Ricky Watts has the ball all the way down to the 10-yard line. And they're really whooping and hollering in Chicago now. Well, you think it's not nice to have your offense pick up a few first downs, then come back, and Reinfeld had that play covered the whole way. He was way back in center field, looked to be making a simple interception. Watts, who some people said isn't as healthy as he would like to be, just took the ball away from Mike. Mike got turned around. Watts was in a perfect position, cut right underneath, made the play. They made some good plays offensively throughout the first half in Chicago, and uh, that was one of them. Boy, was it. 50 yards on that bomb. Vince Evans to Ricky Watts, a wide receiver from Tulsa in the second year. So the Bears are challenging again. They lead the game 3 0. 5.06 to play in the first half. The ball first and 10 at the 11 yard line of Houston. Hand off to Payton. Stutter step and then the Oilers come and hammer Walter Payton. Daryl Hunt hit him, so did Vernon Perry. Bingham also off the pile. But Old Sweetness got it down to the eight. Game three, second down and seven. Running down to 4.30 to play in the first half. Chicago leading 3-0 on a 27-yard Bob Thomas field goal. But the Bears challenging again. They've challenged this game now four times. They're up with points just once, but they're close again. Hand off to Peyton. Peyton somehow eludes that hit and gets it down to the three-yard line. Kennard, the middle guard, finally knocked him down. There's a big difference, Don. He's got about three yards to go for the first down. This is the same situation we saw when they went on third down and three uh, with a running play to Peyton. They've got the same situation. If they're going to go for a touchdown on fourth down, I look for them to run Peyton or Harper. If they're not, I look for them to put the ball up in the air to their tight end. The Oilers' defense has allowed the fewest rushing touchdowns in the NFL this season, only four. Down and three for a first down, third and four for a touchdown. Back to Peyton. Loses his footing, goes down at the five. So Bob Thomas in the field goal unit will come back out. You know that Walter Peyton is sky high for this game. He is every week, but on the other side of the field is another number 34, the two of the preeminent players in the history of the game from the running back standpoint. Matched up Earl Campbell and Walter Peyton. Against awfully good running defenses. They surely are. Thomas now 10 for 15 on field goals this season. Campbell with a bruised knee a little bit earlier will be back in. Here's Thomas with a set down at the 13 yard line. He's right up through the middle again. So Bob Thomas connects for a second time in as many tries. He has been the scoring in this football game as the Bears have a 6 0 lead. 2.55 left to play in the first half in Chicago. We'll be back in a moment. Bob Thomas, who has two field goals, as many tries, ready to kick off again for Chicago. Bears haven't punted this game, have they, John? No, well, when your offense moves the ball every time they get it, as they have on their first four possessions, you're not going to have much need for a punter. Here's the kickoff. Going for the ball is Kyle Roaches at the 11-yard line. He's to the 20. Roaches breaks it down the sideline briefly, gets across the 25. The Bears from scrimmage have outgained the Oilers 206 yards to 79 so far in this game. Here's why this game is so important. The Oilers with a chance to take sole possession. 
of the AFC Central, or if they should lose, go into a three-way tie with the Browns and the world champion Steelers, who came from behind with 11 seconds to play. Bradshaw connected for the touchdown throw, and Pittsburgh now goes to a 7-4 mark along with Cleveland. Bears got some help today from Baltimore, a victor over Detroit. Standing the throw is Stabler out in the flat, going for the ball. It's incomplete at the 42-yard line. White Shoes Johnson couldn't get there. Now they have tried Gary Campbell four or five times. They've been unsuccessful on each occasion. The man seems to be improving so much as a defender against the pass. Let's take a look at Billy White Shoes Johnson. He comes down. He's really become more of a spot player right now. Remember when he had the great speed? Look at the position Campbell has. White Shoes has no chance on the play. Linebacker in perfect position on the coverage, so that makes it second down and 10 for Houston. The Oilers have the ball at the 27-yard line. The snake goes to the run. Here comes Campbell. And Earl Campbell gets out across the 30, out close to the 33-yard line. Campbell gained five, almost six yards. You know, people have given. You wonder why an Earl Campbell picks up yards and why they use their two tight end offense, because it, it isolates the defense into a certain position. It doesn't give them the flexibility to predict which side the ball is going on. David Casper this time was able to move Hartenstein out around the end, allowing Campbell to get up underneath. Dave Casper not only is an excellent receiver, he might be the best blocking tight end this game's ever had. He set to the left, Casper. Now it's third down and about four. Stabler throws, coming back at the ball for a first down. He shuts in as Billy Johnson. And he's out to the 46-yard line of Houston. So the Oilers get the big play. Stabler to Johnson. It's a first down for Houston. 14-yard gain on the play. And, and the Oilers are moving. 157 left to play, so there's a timeout on the field with the Oilers coming up with a first down when we return. The Bears, though, in the lead, 6-0 on two field goals. This is Don Crickey with John Brody back at Soldier Field in Chicago. It'll be first down and 10 for the Houston Oilers. When they break the huddle, they trail in the game, 6-0, 157 to go in the first half. Johnson, who made the third down reception for the first down, is out wide left. Mike Renfro on the right flank for Houston. Stabler goes to Earl Campbell, and he busts it again right up the middle and takes it ahead for 12 or 13 yards and another Houston first down. Don, again, we, you know, the hole has always been to the left side whenever they give that little draw trap to, to Campbell again. It's Dave Casper sitting there with Hardenstein. He's trying to get to the passer. When he does, he's set up for the draw trap. They're making a quick play of it. Stabler on first down, fires hard. Look at Barber come back at the ball. He did get it. Tremendous reception by tight end Mike Barber. Hit him on the forearm, bounced up, and he had the ball before he went down with 124 left. The tremendous part done is look at the reaction on Barber. He doesn't have any idea the ball's coming to him. All of a sudden, oh, look here. <laughs> And the, the reaction to get the ball when Hicks was all over him keeps the drive alive. Second down, one yard to go. About a minute 24, so you got a lot of time to play with. Mike Hartenstein, a big right end for Chicago, has been pressuring the passer. He was recently, as you know, fined $1,000 by the league for what they felt was too hard a hit on Eagle quarterback Ron Jaworski. There's Hartenstein, 73. Buddy Ryan, the defensive line coach of the Bears, said, well, they find finding Hartenstein 1,000 for. They ought to find the guy that missed the block. We're paying him to get the quarterback. I was going to say they should have called Jaworski, see what he had to say. Maybe he could have told him whether or not it was. You know, those defensive, li it. defensive linemen are having an awfully hard time right now. The rules favor the offensive linemen, and I think that, as much as the fact that you can't make contact with the receivers, has given the quarterback more time to throw, allowing the receivers to get down the field better, and they've been a lot less strict on offensive holding. So if there are going to be any people doing any moaning, it's those defensive linemen. Yeah. Those guys not only get held, but when they get there, they got to watch what they do. <laughs> That's right. They got some hombres up front, Chicago, Hampton, Osborne, Page, and Hartenstein leading the NFL with 36 sacks. They have one today. But the Oilers are moving now. Nice down for Stabler. The nine-yard pickup makes it second down and one. He has some good options here with 124 to play in the first half. He goes to the run. Rob Carpenter runs the ball. A fine back out of Miami of Ohio. 
Good blocker, good pass catcher, good runner. And you know what they're doing right now, Don? We mentioned how well the two tight ends are blocking, but Carl Mock is taking Alan Page whichever way they give him a chance. He's head up on him. Boy, they've been opening up their own natural holes. Back at Soldier Field, we're set to go. Houston Oilers have the ball first down at the Chicago Bear 27-yard line. Bears leading the game with 119 to play in the first half, 6 0. Staber throws. He's got a man open. Barber takes it knee high, goes down to the 20. So he got about seven or eight on the first down reception. Boy, he made a fine play because Hampton was sitting from him on his blind side. Actually, Motown's been doing a pretty darn good job on him so far, but uh, that time he got to Staber quick. The Snake's ready to pitch again. At this time, he does get it away. Some set of hands. He comes back at the ball again. They're going to rule it a catch. Incomplete. That was a one bouncer. I think that he caught that one on the short hop. I think what it illustrated is how well Stabler knows where his receivers are. Watch this. He goes back. Now this pass rush is just too fast. You can't get anything set up when you don't have a little more time than this. We take a look at Osborne who makes a fine play getting rid of Motown's. You meant we mentioned also they're moving their linemen around giving them a different look on every play and they've really caused problems pass rush wise. Bob Phillips says a stable he's a quarterback who looks at the field from the line of scrimmage out. Most quarterbacks look deep first but he checks everybody out. They go to Rob Carpenter on third down and three and he responds with a first down with the clock very much a factor now 43 seconds and it's running as Bum Phillips now has his Oilers first and ten and Stabler sets them up without a huddle. The snake six for 14 for 52 yards. Here's a dump pass off. Running high with the ball is Carpenter looking for the 12th man, the out of bounds line, and he gets it and stops the clock with 24 seconds left. A guy like Carpenter can help you so much just by realizing the situation. They still have some timeouts left. They're not in a real big problem with 24 seconds left. They've got about five plays they can run. They need a big one to get it down there. You know, this game really has been one sided in the first half, Don. Chicago should have a bigger lead than six to nothing. We mentioned it earlier. If they didn't capitalize, it might come back to haunt them later in the ball game. If Houston is to uh, score on this drive and go ahead seven to six, it will not be an indication of the way the game's gone, but they only go by the scoreboard. Bottom line six nothing Chicago, two Bob Thomas field goals. 24 seconds left to play in the first half. Campbell's gained 50 yards so far in the game. Stabler, a master at using not only every receiver, he spreads the ball around, gives everybody a chance at the end zone, but also at using the clock. He was a great baseball player at Alabama, good enough to be Major League Scouts when it drafted him in the first round, but he wanted to play football. One timeout left. Carpenter saved the last one for him. Four seconds left. The penalty the sack uh, second down now at 20. Here is a Stabler swinging it out. Gets the oh. ball to Rob Carpenter. He's got a blocker out in front. And Carpenter so wisely uses the sideline. Goes out at the eight-yard line. So he got all the lost yardage back. And now with 14 seconds left, the Oilers have time for how many plays? Well, they have time for two or three more. I thought they had another timeout, but they only have one left. It was a beautiful 15-yard gain, but it's still going to be a little bit short of the first down, third down and two. I don't think Stabler's going to concern himself uh, with running the ball. You can see it's a very deep zone. They know how many timeouts left. They're getting in the end zone. They're not going to let them get down there without somebody having something to say about it. As a result, Stabler comes off to a screen pass and gets the ball off. They've got a couple plays left. Rich is ready on the sidelines, but the Raider, the Oilers want to get seven if they can. They're looking for six on this throw into the end zone, tipped in the air, incomplete. Harry Schmidt, 44, left side corner, had a hand on the ball. They were looking at Renfro, Stabler was. Through the fastball, it was up for grabs momentarily. And now it'll be fourth down, and so Fritz will come out. All right, Stabler elects to go upside. It's third down and three. They're trying to go for all of it on this play. Excellent defensive play again by Tom Hicks, who batted the ball out of any possible reception. They got beat by the best. Brett Shute missed only one in 15 tries coming into the game. You'll remember, hit the upright in the left side from about this distance earlier. Missed it. 
eight seconds left in the first half. Looking for the first points of the day for Houston. Are it's a fake, me? and here's Tim Wilson going into the end zone. It's a touchdown for, for the Houston Oilers. Wilson crashing on in on a fake play. What a great play by the Oilers. Gifford Nielsen made that thing look so smooth that it almost looked like he had kicked the ball. When Frisch made the kick at the ball, Nielsen made such a beautiful play that I don't think anybody but Wilson and Nielsen knew the ball was going to him. That's one of the advantages of having a quarterback back there. Watch. You take the ball, he puts it down and just kind of shuffles it Isn't in. Nobody even saw the thing change. What a play. Everything taken. That's, that's one of the things you find out when you look at game films. You see the way people rush the kicker. You see the way they, they have their tendencies to come inside rush, outside rush. They picked an automatic hole and slipped it in the end zone. So the Oilers score a touchdown. Here's the extra point up by Tony French. And it's good. And Houston on a surprise play. So beautifully executed by Gifford Nielsen, the holder. And the blocking back, Tim Wilson. And the Oilers have their first touchdown of the day and take the lead 7-6. to six. Look at this. Don, you see, <laughs> you see so many of these type plays in the game. But all the ones that work are so well conceived. You see, everybody has a specific assignment. When Wilson gets the ball, it's a touchdown. Just call it the right time in a perfect situation. Our producer, Mike Wiseman, and he's serious, says they call that one the Bummerooski. <laughs> Whatever they call it, Bum likes it. Our director today for NBC is John Gonzalez, says the Houston Oilers, with their first score of the day, take the lead over Chicago 7-6 to six with two seconds left in the first half. They used to play once before against New England. Nielsen's a terrific backup quarterback. He got his chance, you'll remember, against San Diego that day when Campbell was out. And Pastorini was out in the playoffs, and he quarterback Houston the upset win over the winningest team in the league at that point. Another touchdown pass to Nielsen's credit. Eh? Well, that would go as a touchdown pass, I guess, wouldn't it? Can't go as anything else. That's amazing. <laughs> they just run the clock out of the outside kick. That's right, Nielsen is credit with a touchdown pass, even though he was down on one knee and shuffled the ball ahead to Tim Wilson. And just like that, the state of the NFL season here. Back at Chicago, Don Crickey with John Brody scored the half is 7-6. to six. The Houston Oilers are in the lead. Roads get a little brisk here in Chicago. <laughs> yeah, it is up here, but it's getting a little heated down on the field, Don. And with Houston getting the ball back after the kickoff, two drives could take place before the offense gets back on the field when they left with a 6 to nothing lead. I've seen that happen before. The ball game should not be 7-6 to six at this time because the Bears have really taken it to the Oilers in the first half. They've come out a little short on the scoreboard. That's why happened so much in this game. But when we take a look at the stats, you can see they're pretty much evened up. Now, early in the ball game, it was that the Bears had 206 yards. The Oilers didn't have 100, but they came down in their last drive, and then with that little razzle-dazzle job that they put to Tim Wilson, took the lead. This is a big drive for Chicago. They've got to stop the Oilers. Here's the kickoff. Bob Thomas, Kyle Roaches takes it back for Houston. And he comes across the 25, out to the 30. Looked like the free ball for a minute there. I think Houston might have come away with it. Chicago thought they did momentarily, but now the Bear defense comes out. Boy, when you get a fumble like this on the opening, on the opening play of the second half, they really didn't have anybody in excellent position to make the play. If it was going to be recovered, it would have had to have been done by Otis Wilson. He didn't really get a good piece of it. As a result, they keep the ball. First and 10 for Houston. Here comes Campbell across the 30 and a first and 10 carry. He got ahead for about three. Defensive front for the Chicago Bears, Dan Hampton, 99 is the left end, second year. From Arkansas, Jim Osborne, 68, had a fine first half. Alan Page, number 82, the 14-year veteran from Notre Dame at right tackle. Mike Hartenstein, sixth year from Penn State, is the right end. Jerry Muckensturm, Tom Hicks, and Gary Campbell back the line. Schmidt and Ellis are the corners, Fensick and Plank the safeties. Campbell's run for 71 yards and 11 carries. Peyton for 55 yards and 14 carries. Stabler throwing. Down it goes. Renfro's going to be credited with the reception. Tell you, you can almost see from up here how Renfro took, put his attention on the ball when he caught it. Was able to look down at the hash mark, see if he could get his feet inbounds. That's just the mark of an excellent receiver. He's the Fred Belitnikoff of Houston. 
Well, you can see when he gets up in the air, he finds a way to get his feet inbounds, gives him a first down. Also, keep in mind, Houston has picked up some, some yardage on the ground, but they haven't done it by running over the top of the Bears. They've done it by fooling them with delayed traps and lates. On first down, they go to Campbell. Again, he carries off the left side and gets the ball out to the 45-yard line. A pickup of four, second down and six. Hartenstein was on the tackle, along with Tom Hicks. And if you're going to make a good play going to the wide side against the Bears, you have, have, you have to contain Alan Page. Alan Page is, is vulnerable only when you run at him. He's the sort of fellow that's got such great lateral pursuit. Even when that play's going anywhere but at him, as you see uh, Young made a fine block on Page. Gave Campbell a chance to pick up five. Well, he's got a force against an Allen Page. Bob Young, 6'1", 285. On second down and six, they go to the draw. Look at Earl Campbell rip it up the middle. And Campbell, who had only 254 yards after the first five games, slowed by a leg muscle pull, has been extraordinary, averaging 33 carries a game his last six times. God, I really think that the strategy of the Bears is such that they've said, OK, on this little delay trap, we're going to give them that. They'll call it two or three times a game. I don't think they were prepared to see it five or six different times. Alan Page is giving up everything trying to get to the quarterback. Walk just lets him go whatever way he likes, lets Campbell run the, the opposite direction. It creates a natural hole. They've run the play effectively six times already. So now the Oilers have first down, 38-yard line. They go right back to Campbell, and Earl Campbell takes it down to the 30-yard line. Campbell tearing it up. Jonathan Hoke, a rookie defensive back from Ball State, ran him out. On his 14th carry, the last one, Campbell just went 100 yards for the day. Okay, and, and you know, if you notice, when he got back into the secondary, it looked like a, a natural collision course. I really think when Earl got hurt a little bit in the first half, it took away some of his mobility out in the open field. That time, one of the rare times he will run out of bounds when somebody corners him against the sideline. And as you stated, he just went over 100 yards. That's the sixth consecutive 100-yard game this season. And uh, you just can't say enough about the man. Second down and two, Houston. Bear linebackers fill. Here comes Gary Campbell up from the right side to hit Earl Campbell. But he gets ahead for about three and the first down. So the Oilers keep it simple. Earl Campbell left, Earl Campbell right, Earl Campbell up the middle. And Earl Campbell left is absolutely awesome if they don't do something to take that away from them. When you have a Bob Young, you've got a Leon Gray, a Dave Casper, and Carl Mock all blocking to that left side. That's four all pros leading an all pro. Campbell holds the National Football League record for the most consecutive 100-yard games, seven in a row. He'll have to wait till his next time out against the Jets next week to see if he can tie that record. Lead by a point, seven to six. Stabler out in the flat, and he gets his man, the tight end, gets the ball and buries his way down inside the 15-yard line. Again, Barber making the reception. They haven't thrown to Casper. He's got a muscle pull problem. He's been blocking very well, but doesn't have the full mobility to run those deeper patterns as Barber does. The fact that he's in there leads. It, it, it necessitates Chicago being careful. They don't know how badly hurt he is. And I've seen a lot of very injured people come out and run uh, 40, 50 yards for a touchdown. But you notice the success of Campbell lent itself to Barber getting out of a one-on-one -on -one situation with a linebacker. First down and 10. Oilers free football and Stabler pounces on it very quickly. Snake lost the handle. Bears couldn't get to it, so it'll be second down now for Houston. You know, when that sort of thing happens, Don, oftentimes on that particular play, Carl Mock was trying to get out quick, lead the play to the left side. He got out a little bit fast. Stabler never had a handle on the ball. As a result, a fumble occurred. The play never got underway. It's real simple. It just never really got into his hand. Generally, a center is either blocking off or straight ahead. That problem wouldn't occur. Campbell on second down and 12 takes the ball down close to the 11-yard line. I'll tell you, it's, we thought we'd take a look at what a center does during a series of plays. Carl Mock went in the huddle. They called the same play again. The exchange was a little more clean. But 
running to the left side. The Bears have stuffed them when it's a straight ahead play. Look at Alan Page. He's occupied two or three blocks allowing the linebackers to make the play after a short game. Third and nine. Hawkins, Durham, and Hicks were on the tackle for Chicago. But now the ball's down to the 12 yard line of the Bears. Third down and nine for Stabler in his offense. One wide receiver, White Shoes, Johnson is left. Stabler goes to a draw. Rob Carpenter looks the Bears defense and shut it down. <laughs> but again, Carpenter, with his quickness of foot and mind, moves the ball to the middle of the field to give Tony Fritz the best angle. Well, he went in there because Al Harris was all over him, Don. That's the first time they have stopped that little delay trap and looked like, hey, if you go to the well one time too often, we're going to wait until they do stop it. They stopped it with a little stunt. First one of the day. If for Nielsen with the only touchdown pass of the day, and he got it right from that right knee, as you remember, the fake extra fake field goal attempt in the pitch to a blocker, Tim Wilson. He went into the end zone with two seconds left in the first half. Subsequent extra point put Houston ahead for the first time. Now Fritz kicks a line drive. It wasn't pretty, but it was good. 29 yards. It was ugly. <laughs> I don't know how it got over the line of scrimmage. But it went over the crossbar. It was 11 feet high. You only need 10, and it's now at 12. 10 to 6 ball game. The Houston Oilers up on the Chicago Bears with 9.13 to play in the third quarter. Don Cricky with John Brody back at Soldier Field in Chicago. 29 yard field goal was good by Tony Fritsch, and the Oilers now lead the Bears 10 to 6. Here's Fritsch in for the kickoff, delivers it downfield. Dave Williams loses the handle inside the 10 for Chicago. Comes across the 15 yard line. Look out, got a blocker. Across the 30, across the 35, and all the way out to the 41 yard line. So it looked like it was going to be a very poor play for Chicago. It was turned into a 32 yard return by Dave Williams and his blockers. Jeff Groth finally knocked him out of bounds. When we talk about he got a blocker, the blocker did something when he got out there. This is the sort of thing that happens so often. It, it changes everybody's route, everybody's timing. Generally, a crack develops as it did in this case. Look at Ricky Watts. position on the 41. Chicago land from the WMAQ News Chapter 5. The temperature starting to drop now on the shores of Lake Michigan. The Chicago Bears trailing in the game 10-6. They go to the run. Here comes Peyton. Nothing there. Oilers hem him in and knock him down. Brazil, his former teammate at Jackson State, caught him throwing back. Bethay was also on the play. Tough guy to block, Elvin Bethay. That's been a favorite play of Walter Payton's, that little sweep with, with Harper leading. But today, because of the field being as wet as it is and it's damp down there, it's almost been nullified. Can't cut back against the grain when you're going to fall down on, on your plant. Walter Payton now came in with great recommendations. He was the leading scorer in NCAA history when he came out of Jackson State. Still is. 464 points he scored as a collegiate. He's been better as a pro. Second down and eight. Vince Evans drops to throw. Stands in, takes a look. He has a problem. He takes off very nicely. Evans got ahead for a gain of about five yards out to the 48-yard line. Here's a situation when you, you have to wait. There is no one you can come off to because the play was designed to go to Robin Earl. Now, the pass rush was so swift that it got back in Evans' face before he could wait for Earl to come open. You can see he's running a pattern on Vernon Perry and never really got open. Jack Tatum's ready to pick the ball off if he were to throw it. As a result, he had to take what he could, go right up the middle, pick up about seven. Vince Evans is averaging over 4.6 yards a rush so far this season. Third down and three for Chicago. Evans ready to pitch it. Stands in, throws in the flat, gets his man. Dave Williams has it for a first down. He was thrown back, but he got the ball down to the 47-yard line of Houston. Greg Bingham was covering him, taking the first back out, but it's a first down for the Bears. That's a good throw by Evans. He's not at all skitterish in there. He came back. He gave himself, he gave Williams a chance to run his pattern when he did fire the ball. He was standing straight up. He's, he's got very good posture for a quarterback. Now, I know that sounds funny because so many of the great quarterbacks have been slumped shouldered, but he stands very tall, and it enables him to get the ball out a little higher. It's a natural movement, but it's, it's very good posture. Very good number. Seven for 11, 115 yards. Bears have a first down, and Evans going to put it up again. Big rush, and the Bears pick it off. But then Evans loses the ball. It's a free football. Still free. It does. Look at this. 
Houston Oilers are finally going to get it. It looks like maybe they're going to rule it down, though. I looks think like Chicago's, a bad ball drill. Chicago's going to keep the ball. It was blown dead at the 46-yard line. And I'm interested to see when they blew it dead because I couldn't find anybody that had control of the ball. And I don't think any of those players on the field thought that it, anyone had control of the ball. All right. Evans goes back, standing straight up. Just about to release. You cannot see from your backside. Excellent play by Robert Brazil, bringing him down. The ball went away. And I don't think anybody had it, but somebody saw it quickly. Looked like they were chasing some kind of a small animal. 6.29 to play in the third quarter. I'm certain that they blew, they blew the ball dead and didn't see the fumble when he fell down on the ground because that's where the ball was given back to the Bears. Chicago will accept that, although they have to come out of a hole now. It'll be second down coming up. Second down and 18 from their 46-yard line. Oilers lead the game 10-6 after Chicago took a 6-0 lead on two field goals. Bears with three wide receivers. Evans has the long-range arm. He can gun it long. Stands in. Let's her rip down the middle. Excellent coverage by the Oilers. Tatum coming in on the ball. Also Vernon Perry as he tried to go to Bashnagel. All right, now, when you prepare for a team, you see you see certain things that should be open in certain situations. When the Oilers go to the five-back defense, they, don't ex they didn't expect Tatum to be playing center field and freelancing all over the middle of the field, which he has done. On three occasions, they've tried to come to their receiver in the middle of the field, turning in, and they have been unable to catch him. They have, been ha they have had some, some success going to the outside, but Tatum's been covering that middle like a blanket. Tatum, of course, has his sixth interception of the season in this game. Picked it off in the end zone. Now it's third down and 18 for Chicago. Vince Evans with a deep drop. Looks, throws it out to Peyton. He's trouble. Eludes Perry, but then Perry catches up and gets him at the 48-yard line of Houston. So the Bears will have to punt the ball back to the Oilers with 5.42 and the clock running in the third quarter. Bum Phillips with his team rolling, four straight wins, a 7-3 and three record, and a chance today if a victory is held up, score holds up, to take sole possession of first place in the AFC Central as Pittsburgh beat Cleveland. They're both 7-4 and four now. Bob Parsons in to punt for the first time. There's only been one other punt in the game. Parsley hit one for Houston. Carson hits it very high and well, angles it, Roach, go back, fingles a fair catch and lets it hop into the end zone. So it'll come out to the 20, and on a 48-yard punt by Bob Parsons, the Oilers get it back with 5.07 left to play in the third quarter, Houston leading 10-6. We'll be back in Chicago after this. We're Exxon. We're Jim Sessom, finding better ways to get electricity from sunlight. We're John Willis at a promising oil find in Alaska. We're Dr. John Sinfeld, whose work on new catalysts won him the National Medal of Science. We're Illinois coal miners, providing fuel for Midwest power plants. We're Cindy Tate, helping bring a $350 million oil platform into production. We're more than 100,000 people working on energy. We're Exxon. You know, I love the fresh, clean smell of barley because I can almost taste the Schlitz beer I'm going to make from it. I'm Frank Selinger. Recently, I came to Schlitz as chief executive. Mostly, I check on the business end. But after 40 years as a master brewer, I check the barley, too, and the other fine grains to make a really smooth beer. Taste my Schlitz. at Chicago. The temperature now in the 30s, but wind's not been a factor at all. This great arena ringed by American flags, and they're all grouped right down straight. Wind not a factor. Houston with the ball, first down at 10. Campbell gets the call from the 20, got to the 21. You know what they've done? They've put Ron Rydouts in there at defensive tackle, and they've let they've let Alan Page come off. Now, what had been happening is that there were two ways they could stop and effectively defense that little draw, that delay run by Campbell. One is to take Alan Page out of there because what he's going to do is throw everything to the winds and try to get to the passer. That's his personality. Rideouts is a little stronger in there. That's why they've got him in. So now it's going to be second down and nine. Stabler pitches back Campbell behind Wilson. Earl Campbell turns it upfield. Earl 
Campbell has a first down for Houston out to the 33-yard line. You're with us for the pregame show. You heard the famed fight announcer Don Dunphy build this game. Between Campbell and Peyton is a matchup of heavyweight runners, knocked out runners. And Campbell's had the big day, but this one will come back. It will, but it won't take anything away from the individual play he made. You know, oftentimes they say, what are the secrets of the outstanding backs? That time he followed his blocker so well you couldn't believe it. It takes a lot of patience to be a great running back, particularly when you're running the ball wide. He's got to wait. He's got to let Carl Mock get in position. He's got to let Mo Towns do his job. Look at Fisher. Now it all forms a picture. If he, if he made his decision okay, earlier, that hole wouldn't have been 60. there. He'd have been stopped for no game. Down. That's the Oilers' second penalty, 15 yards assessed against them. The Bears haven't had a flag all day. Great blocking by Carl Mock, 55. Mo Towns is out there. Fisher and Young and Leon Gray. The offensive surge. David Casper set left as a tight end. Mike Barber to the right. Second down, 19. Free football for a moment. Bears almost had it. Oilers kept it. Yes, sir. And they stopped that little delayed trap, too. Osborne and Page were on the stop for Chicago. down they have Alan Page back in there oh they've been having him in there on running they in fact he only took a couple play yeah. break Donnie but it did it was effective when when they let him rest for a play Bears hold on this down though they could come back with the ball in good field position after a punt it's third down and 17 for Houston penalty markers all over look at the blitz by Plank and down goes Kenny Stabler at the two yard line safety Doug Plank was coming on the blitz but there's penalty markers down at the line of scrimmage and not only were they caught jumping the gun but the safety blitz almost created a turnover they won't have to take this penalty now they'll make Houston kick out of their own end zone Hunter likes to get 15 yards to take his snap he won't have that chance here as we see <laughs> Bob Frederick the referee 341 left to play in the third quarter. Ball start. Offense. Left side of the offensive line. And Don, you might wonder why the penalty was taken. It was taken simply because the whistle had blown the ball dead before they got to Stabler. Stabler is now 10 of 19, 89 yards. You see the one interception. Third down and forever. Third and 22. And off to Carpenter, running straight ahead against the punting room at least, as he takes the ball across the 15-yard line of the 17. And out comes Parsley and the Houston punting team. Mike Hartenstein and Jim Osborne were on the tackle. Defense seems to have settled down. They're doing a much better job in that drive than they had heretofore. Last week against Washington, the Bears got 21 points in the first quarter. First time they've done that since 1953. Ended up winning the first half 35 nothing. But as Neil Armstrong said, lost our momentum. We lost the second half 21 nothing. But they still won the game over Washington easily. Walter shot is back deep. He's standing at Chicago's 46-yard line. Parsley against a big rush gets it away. Parsley goes down. The Oilers will get a first down. Bears went for the block and they didn't get it. He's down, and if he's not hurt, he's going to let people think he is. He is a little bit. He did get hit. It's one of those things that you, uh, when you sell out trying to block a punt, you must make sure you take the proper angle because any little nudge can you run you right into the kicker, and it appeared to me that happened. Fourth and 13 play. Good surge from Parsley's right. You see Bashnagel come in there, almost got a piece of the ball. Bruce Heron was a guy. Defense, defense, number 51 running into the kicker. First down. First penalty on Chicago, but what it does, it stops the Bears from getting the football. And Houston has it with a first down at the Oilers 22-yard line with 2.48 left to play in the third quarter. Play like that hurts you just as much as an interception, Don. Oilers continue to lead the game 10 to 6. Stabler quarterback two come from behind wins over Chicago here at Soldier Field in 76 28 27 and in 78 25 19 this time the snake drills it on the far side incomplete going for Renfro a big rush. 
position of two ends. Hampton 99 and Hartenstein 73. I'll tell you, people have tried Terry Schmidt's side throughout the year. Some have had with mixed results. Today he has held his own, maybe a little better than that. That time there was nowhere to throw the ball except in the cheap seats. And that's where Stabler elected to throw it. So it'll bring up second down at the 22 yard line. Second down and 10 for Houston. Gary Schmidt goes out in the left corner. Oilers lead the game 10 to 6, 242 to play in the third quarter. Campbell is caught, gets away, gets ahead for about three yards to the 25. Gary Campbell caught him. Free agent linebacker playing the right outside. Fourth year from Colorado. Alan Page started it all. He got, he got, went through a little crack, got to Campbell before anybody else. Page has had a storied career after a consensus All-American honors as an Notre Dameer's last two years. He, of course, is the only defensive player ever to win most valuable player honors in the NFL back in 71. Played in four Super Bowls. Stabler throws and the ball is caught. Look at the hands on Renfro. Looked it right into his hands. It looked like Schmidt might have tipped it a little bit, but Mike Renfro makes a 14-yard reception. The Oilers have another first down. Don, this is about as well as a defensive back can make a play in the situation that existed. It was a safety blitz. He's all alone out there with Mike Renfro. You notice he he's got to take away the deep spot. Renfro cuts just inside him. Schmidt's in perfect position to make the play. Just an outstanding execution between Stabler, who was getting very good pass rush, and Renfro came up with the ball down low. Mike Renfro from Texas Christian. What a great player his father was. Ray Renfro at those Cleveland Brown championship teams. And here on the first down carry off the 41-yard line is Earl Campbell. Bunched over the top for a couple of yards. Brad Shearer, now the second year from Texas. In a defensive left tackle for Jim Osborne made the stop. Page goes back in. Ron Rydells comes out. Defensive line of Chicago. They're moving people around interior-wise, Don. From, from tackle to tackle, they never give the Oilers the same look. Stabler on a drop, but the play is whistled dead. Fenley markers go down to the line of scrimmage. Just depends on what the official saw. Campbell's been carrying the full load for Houston these recent games. 20 carries already today, 113 yards. Small start, 58 new offense. Look at the time of possession in the third quarter. Oilers have owned the football for the most part. Can't get back in the ball game without it. And they are in the lead 10 to 6. But now the mark off against Houston. Ball start. 47 seconds left to play in the third quarter. Be second down and 13 now. Campbell goes out. They have the pass catchers in. Three of them out in the flanks. There are a pair of loads on the sideline. New tight ends in there. Rob Carpenter now swings out of the backfield. Stabler's throwing. Mike Renfro goes for the ball. It's tipped away beautifully. Gary Schmidt. Seventh year player from Ball State came in here as a free agent from New Orleans. Goes up and breaks up the play and looked like Renfro was going to make the reception. Well, you know what he did is he just he predicted where Stabler was going with the ball. Schmidt is responsible underneath for Rob Carpenter coming out on the right side of your of your screen, but Carpenter never could get out in the flat. As a result, it released Schmidt to go back, make the play, and keep Stabler from being able to throw the ball underneath. Renfro actually made a pretty good play to keep Schmidt from intercepting. Houston Oilers have a test coming with the upcoming schedule. They're at New York next Sunday. Then they play Cleveland. And five days later, they play the Pittsburgh Steelers. Here they come again. On third down and 13, Stabler looks, throws, coming back at the ball and making the reception is Renfro. But he's way short of the first down, catching it at the 39-yard line. Gain of only about three yards. So the punting team comes out. And Chicago will get it back on a punt unless they hit Parsley again. Terry Schmidt stopped that drive almost single-handedly. On no occasion did he allow any of the receivers to be open. And when you get a one-on-one -on -one situation, you're generally going to find a wide receiver open. I guess old Cliff wasn't as badly hurt as some people had predicted. Nope, he's back and ready to punt the ball, standing back at his 25-yard line. That's 
the end of the third quarter. Glenn Wallershot is back deep before they get the punt away. The third quarter comes to the end. Parsley in the game, standing at his 25-yard line, ready to punt now for Houston. Oilers lead the game 10 to 6. Opening play of the fourth quarter. Wallershot back deep. Parsley hits it very nicely. Wallershot signals the fair catch at the 20. So with 14.53 to play in the game, let's go to New York to Bryant Gumble, right? And the Bears have the ball, trailing 10-6, fourth quarter, lots of time, 14.53 to play. Bears took an early lead on two Bob Thomas field goals. Oilers led at the half 7-6, extended the lead on a French field goal. Vince Evans at quarterback, hands off. Not much there. Bull Harper tries the middle of the Houston defense, and those Oilers are tough to move out. Andy Doris hit him. Mr. Steady, Andy Doris. He doesn't get much of the ink, but he gets in on a lot of the tackles. He really does. Eighth year from New Mexico, Doris number 69 at the left end. Kennard is the middle guard, and Elvin Bethay the right end. Our defense hadn't given up a whole lot this half. First half, you remember the Chicago Bears moved consistently into scoring range. Came away with two field goals. Bears deploy wide receivers, one to the right, two to the left. On second down and nine. Three-man rush. Evans stands in against it. Myers, he's got a man open. Oh. Eschnagel comes back at the ball. Free football is downed. Eschnagel hit. Ruled incomplete. I don't know what they're going to rule it down, but Eschnagel really sucked it up because Daryl Hunt was on a direct collision course with him. When the ball was in the air, in order for him to even get to it first, he had to just forget everything else and get after that ball. Helmet to helmet. Nash Nagel, the big play man for the Chicago Bears for his five seasons with him. And you see the man that threw the ball. You can see those collisions taking place before they oh, happen. Man. Hunt had no alternative. He had to do something to shake the ball loose. Bears have to go back in the huddle and line up. You can see the man that's down there with Brian. Vince Evans was on the dead run from the time he threw it. Those are the kind of balls you wish you didn't throw after you let them go. No matter how important the situation, you know it's a direct problem as soon as you let that ball go. Are uh, the kind Bastnagel would like to throw back. 13.58 to play in the game. So Brian Bastnagel is up being helped. Uh, we're very happy to report that Brian Bashnagel's all right. This buck guy took the head-on shot from one of the hallmark stickers in this league, even though he's only been out there for two years, Daryl Hunt. We're there it is now. At normal speed, too, Don, so you're going to get an opportunity to see just Man. what the impact was. You know, they say, hey, a, a good receiver will go in the middle. That's a little above and beyond. He'll go in, but it's a quarterback's job to protect him, and I know that Vince Evans would like to have had that ball back. It's third down and nine coming up for Chicago. 21-yard line. Yep. Well, there's left early. We'll see if they were drawn off. Evans might have a free play. He makes the connection to Peyton. He's got a set of hands. Oh, sweetness. He comes across the 30. He'll have a first down if the play goes. That's an alert play by the offense. They, they all held their place. They allowed the defensive line, line group to get off ahead of the ball. It was a free play. They'd have picked up five yards anyway. But if everybody stays cool and does their job, you can really get some big plays when things like this happen. Evans is back there. He stays on Walter Payton the whole time, man-to-man -man on Bob Brazil, picks up the first down and keeps their drive alive. And the fourth quarter clock shows 13.49 to play. Vince Evans has thrown the ball 15 times. He's completed nine for 132 first yards down. for the Bears. Play goes, and the Bears get a first down. That was Walter Payton getting his hooks at it and taking it ahead for the first down. Yardage on a third and nine play. So the Bears, trailing by four, now have the ball out to their 32-yard line. Robin Earl, the tight end, is set left. James Scott goes wide right. So does Ricky Watts. I set in the backfield. Deep back is Payton. Play fake by Evans. Stands in. Look it. He's going to go. Evans moving out. He's across the 40. Evans is out to the 44-yard line. He gains 13 yards in a first down. All right, when you have a guy, Don, that can do the things that Evans does have, and Houston only sent a three-man line on the play, Elvin Bethay beat Ted Albrecht originally. It's the guard's responsibility. If he sees somebody getting loose to help out, good coordination offensive line-wise. Bethay gets by Albrecht. You can see Albrecht trying to hang on. Here comes Noah Jackson. When he kicks him out, Evans 
Jackson steps up, picks up the first down. That's good coordination between line and quarterback. And it's a first down gain as Evans has now run with the ball three times, and the Chicago quarterback has gained 22 yards. The Bears are trailing by four in the fourth quarter. A lot of time. Pitch back Pete. And great defenses coming up to make the play from the right corner is Greg Stemrick. Number 27. And the clock runs. 12.50 to play. Bears with a great chance to gain some ground in the NFC Central. Lions were beaten today. Their record stands at 6 and 5. Chicago could be only one game behind if they can come be from behind to beat the Oilers. And Houston with a victory would have sole possession of the AFC Central lead. So far, Don, the game has been the Oilers have been able to use the personality of Campbell, which they like so well. The Bears have thrown the ball to a number of receivers. They've allowed Roland Harper to run the ball a little more than normal. Peyton, as a result, hasn't hasn't really come up with the stats. Campbell has 1,207 yards for the season. Sims has 1,045. Peyton has 956. Evans throws. It's slapped down. Coming up, and the attempted throw to James Scott was J.C. Wilson, left side corner. Take a look now at the NFC Central. And how important it is to Chicago, it's all bottled up. Minnesota in a first place tie with the Lions now. Packers were beaten today by the Giants. Tampa Bay losing to Minnesota. And the Bears with a chance to move into second place. You know, it's one thing if they could win this ball game to be one game out. But if, you, if they were to lose, they'd be in last place with four teams to go ahead of. Now, two games is way too much with only five to play if you have to beat four teams on your way to the top. So this drive is about as crucial to the Bears season as you can find. It's a big one. It's a big down, too. Third down and 10 for Evans in the Bear offense. From their 43, Vince Evans deep drop. The Bears pick up a blitz. Evans fires. He's got a man open coming back in the ball for a first down. It's Ricky Watts, who made that great 50-yard reception early in the game. This one for 14 yards on a third and 10 play, and the Bears drive on. Give the offensive line credit. It was a blitz, a seven-man blitz. You can see there are no linebackers in between Watts and Evans. Evans hung in there perfectly. Wilson has no play on the on the play. There is nobody between him and, and Evans. That in that case it happened to be Stemrick, but that's good hanging in there by the quarterback. Excellent pattern by Watson, a first down for the Bears. This is really a good one. 11-27 left to go in the game. Here's the strike by Evans to Ricky Watts. First down play, Chicago on the Houston side of the field. Oilers go down now. As big lineman ready to tee off. They go to Peyton, cutting inside behind his blockers. Takes the ball down close to the 40. Got about three. On the knockdown for the Houston Oilers it was Greg Bingham, 54. He was the first man to hit Walter Payton. And Stemrick was also on the play. And Houston no. with a chance here, of course, to go eight and three if they can hold the lead and take sole possession of first in the Central Division. As the Steelers with 11 seconds left to play today beat Cleveland, Brad Shaw to Swan was the difference. Remember, too, Houston plays Cleveland and Pittsburgh. It would be nice if they went into those two games with a one-game lead. They know the importance. Oilers with a four-game win streak. Chicago's not won more than one game in a row all year. Evans looks, stands, throws. It's almost intercepted by Bingham. The play is broken up. Greg Bingham moved up on the ball. This big linebacker from Purdue covering Walter Payton. You Robin can... Earl saying, where were I? Well, you know, it's funny. A quarterback sits back there, and there are 22 players on the field. He's lucky if he can pick out one guy and hope that he gets open. It's a pretty good pick to choose a Walter Payton when you're working on linebackers. In this case, when Bingham goes out to cover Payton, it leaves Robin Earl all alone. At least Robin thought so, but I'm not so sure that number 37, Mike Reinfeldt, wasn't in a position to pick the ball off had he come to him. So now the Bears are faced with another big third down as they trail Six in the fourth quarter, third down and seven coming up from the 41-yard line of Houston. Evans, deep drop, time. Now he throws. Look at Peyton go up and get the ball. But he didn't get the first down. The Oilers get him at the 35, and he's awful close. And Andy Doris forced him to throw the ball a little quicker than he liked. But I think this is the time right now that their coaching staff has to have prepared what to do if we got fourth down and one and a half. I don't think there's much decision to make. They may not get the ball back in this field position again. They need a touchdown. A field goal won't do them any good. They can, they're not close enough to kick one anyway. This is just a big fourth down play. One and a half yards to go for a first. So Peyton has caught five balls today for 48 yards. He has 108 
yards total offense. Campbell's gotten all of his running the ball. And now a week with John Brody. This is Don Crickey back at Soldier Field. Fourth down coming up for the Bears now, John. Looks like they're going to go for it. Well, sure they are. It's a little over a yard to go. I think that it really puts the offense at a disadvantage. When you call timeout, you come over and do a lot of discussion. It gives the defense time to re regroup. And when they regroup, one yard's a long way to go. I think they should be prepared before that situation hand happens. Get in there with their short yardage offense and get going. We'll see. Fourth down and one for the Chicago Bears in the fourth quarter. They trail 10-6. Evans calls his own number, throws in the Oilers tip it away. Who's that man? That's 32, Vernon Perry. Who came in and tipped the ball. A big, big play for the Houston Oilers. They take over the football. And Neil Armstrong with a gamble play to his quarterback. And the Oilers come up with the big defensive effort and take over the ball with 947. Some of those Chicago Bear fans, their team in a little bit of a hole right now, down 10-6. Minnesota beats Tampa Bay today, 38-30 to go into a first place tie with Detroit NFC Central. Cowboys rally and beat St. Louis 31-21. And now Houston has the ball. The Oilers in the lead 10-6. Stabler play fake and looking long. Penalty markers down. Going for the ball is Renfro. He's got the ball he's inside the 15 he's in the end zone but there is a penalty marker down who's it against 65 yard play holding against Houston it comes back you just couldn't ask for a better a better executed play oh, Renfro was... made the, the perfect move at the right time you know how Schmidt's been all over the top of Renfro all day went down made the move to the outside when he did look back quick he was gone it was a perfectly thrown ball one holding penalty takes seven points away from them Offensive holding, number 60, first down. Hold against Ed Fisher, but I'll tell you, Ed Fisher is one of the most underrated players in his position in the league. The right guard from Arizona State, he's had a great year. I'll tell you who he's not underrated by. That's the defensive tackles that have to play against him. You very, you very seldom see his man sitting in Stabler's face. Even though it was called back, beautifully executed play. Now they've got second down and 20, or first down and 20. This Renfro's a force, though. They get it to him. He'll catch it. Here's Earl Campbell, first and 20. Tyler Rose doesn't get much. He's swept under at the 28-yard line of Houston. That almost broke the game in that 65-yard play, but as you know, it came back. San Diego, 13-7 leader over Kansas City in third quarter. San Francisco, throws of a seven-game losing streak, rallying now to come from behind at Miami. They've lost some tough ones. They may get by in one. Campbell wears unusually big thigh pads. They were designed by that <laughs> inventor down in Texas, Byron Danzas. He needs it for what's under him. <laughs> He'll have to protect. Second down and 10. Here's the big rush, and they get Stabler back at the 16-yard line. Coming on the blitz was Otis Wilson, the rookie number one draft choice from Louisville. He came in untouched. The snake saw problems as soon as he looked up. Well, you know, when you get in a situation where you can use a man's skills, they drafted him first. He was he was everybody's pick as an outstanding linebacker when the Bears picked him first. The Bears have been noted for great linebackers. It looks like he's going to be one in the future. Get him in a blitz situation. Get that guy that's fast and knows how to get to that QB. Third down at 27 coming up now. White Shoes Johnson goes to the left. Renfro goes to the right. Interception percentage picks way up. The turnover percentage picks way up. He always felt he had to do it himself. I think that's what's changed about his personality. He's going to let the D's do it. And the D's got a standing ovation when they came off the field now as the Oilers have to punt the ball back. Deep for Chicago is Walter Schott standing at his 36-yard line. Parsley as the Bears hold off in the rush. Parsley really nailed it. Walter Schott all the way back. It was 22. Alludes one tackler. Gets the ball back close to the 30. 52-yard punt and a 
six yard return by Waltershide. And so with 7.29 left to play, the Bears get it back. They trail in the game 10 to 6. Let's go, Bears, is the chant. They got a ways to go. Four points down. 7.29 to play. Evans takes his team out of the huddle. At Houston Oilers in the lead 10 6. As the temperature now has gotten quite cold in Chicago, down in the low 30s. But wind is not a factor. Evans stands in. He throws. He's got a man out there, but it's a little too out of distance for James Scott. Through the interconference play of this 1980 season, the American Conference with 21 victories to 10 for the NFC. AFC leading this one 10-6, but it's a long way from over. 7-24 seven seven left to go, but throwing on first down now leaves Evans with two downs to get the 10 he needs. Very evenly played game, Don, but this 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 drive right here could change the direction of the Bears for the entire year. It could put Vince Evans over the hump. He's a guy that's played very well today, been very effective. They haven't turned many of his many of his completions into touchdowns. In fact, they haven't made one today, and that's been their only problem. Ricky Watson, Chris Haynes come wide left. Scott is wide right. Second down at 10. Evans throws. He's got a man. There's a penalty marker down though in the Chicago backfield. We could have a hold against the Bears with 7-17 left to play. The throw is to Dave Williams, a runner coming out of the backfield. Vernon Perry, the strong safety, got him. But it's coming back. They're going to get Chicago on a hold, it looks like. Bears have been guilty of very few infractions. Both of them coming at the wrong time. So instead of 10 yards for the first down now, the markoff <laughs> is back to the 19. It's going to be 20. Offensive holding, number 70, second down. Dennis Lick, the big right tackle call for the hold. Lick and Albrecht the tackles. Jackson and Sorry the guards. Dan Neal the center. So the Euler defense now is ready to tee off and go at Evans. Second down and 20 coming up for the Bears. Again, Chris Haynes and Ricky Watts come wide left. And James Scott goes wide right. Right end staying in the block. Evans looks. Here he goes. He's got room. Evans has got a lot of room. Evans is ahead. First down, and he's not done yet. Look at Vince Evans. It's a foot race to the goal line. Tatum has the angle on it and gets it out of bounds, but it's inside the 25-yard line. The biggest play of this game. Vince Evans, the quarterback, runs 55 yards from scrimmage. Seven yards for the entire ball game, all in critical situations. All his receivers were covered. Credit the offensive line with giving him a hole to run through. He, look, that's a fine drop. He didn't skitter or scatter around to the outside trying to run, run around somebody laterally. Went straight up the middle. Put all of his receivers in a perfect position to help him out. Made the play and forced Jack Tatum to run him out of bounds after a 55-yard game. So Vince Evans, that superb athlete, 6'2", 212, who brings this great extra dimension to the quarterback position, the ability to run, turns in a 55-yard run. He's run with the ball four times in this game and has gained 80 yards. Now the Bears are challenging. They're down by four. Fourth quarter, 7.03 to play, and on first down, Peyton runs ahead, and the Oilers jam it up. Elvin Bethay was there, so was Daryl Hunt. to get it into the end zone and the Oilers who are awful tough to take it in against particularly with the run. Houston doesn't give up much to the run. Substitutes come in now. Robin Earl comes out. Bull Harper comes out. Chris Haynes goes back in along with Dave Williams a pass catcher. When Dave Williams is in the ball game you can bet he's not going to be leading Peyton around the end. Second down and nine for Chicago. 23 yard line of Houston. 10-6 Oilers fourth quarter. Evans a blitz and Robert Brazil, the all-pro from Jackson State, comes in untouched and gets the clean lick on the Bear quarterback, and that knocks Evans down back outside the 30-yard line. When you say a clean lick, I think more than anything else, that play exposed how strong Robert Brazil is. He actually picked Evans off his feet and caught him before he let him hit the ground. He made sure he didn't fall down, but he just made sure he had it. A big run and set of the gun. 6'4, 240, one of the fastest players on the Houston team, Robert Brazil. 
five years in the league prior to this, four times first team all pro. Well, the impressive thing is the strength that the man possesses. He's got Evans off the ground. <laughs> now Chicago has the ball third down and 19. 33 yard line of Houston. Evans stands in. They give him time. He throws. He's got a man. Walter Payton inside the 20. And Payton is down to the 17 yard line, about four yards short of a first down. Vernon Perry knocked him down. And now we have fourth down coming up for Chicago. They put another blitz on Evans. When they did, there was nobody in the area to handle Payton. Payton is an all purpose back. He's such a great runner. Nobody realizes what a fine pass receiver he is. Six receptions today. situation not only are they regrouping it also gives a chance for the Oilers to regroup it'll be seven when we come back 521 to play the Bears will have the ball it's very cold at Soldier Field in Chicago the Bears now with a big big play coming up and remember it's the fourth time they've called timeout in critical situations they've only got one timeout left I think you ought to be a little farther ahead of the game than that fourth down and two for Chicago 17-yard line of Houston. Evans drops to throw. He's got to make it work. He throws. The man is open. It's caught. And they lose it. The ball was caught by Watts, but he lost it. It's incomplete. Houston again takes over the ball with 5.14 to play. Watts has made some great plays in this game. You'll remember the 50-yarder he caught to set up a field goal. Not, he made a pretty good play to get back to the ball. Greg Stemrick was all over him like a blanket. When you're one-on-one, -on -one, again, they're coming with their linebackers. You can see everybody putting pressure on Evans. He finds a little crack. He sees Watts coming back. Stemrick made a fine play to get his handle on the ball. Field level. Watch again. Evans stands in. He's got the fastball arm, and he delivers after eluding the rush. Watts coming back at the ball has it, but Stemrick making the connection with Watts splits him from the ball. Fourth down, and the Bears turn it over now to Houston, but there's still time left. Oilers want to control the ball if they can. End off. Campbell, nothing there. This Bear defense won't back up. And now let's switch back to New York and Brian Gumbel. Brian? Thank you, Don Cricky at Mile High. We're set to go as the News Chopper 5 helicopter of WMAQ looks on from on high. They go to Earl Campbell to the Houston Oilers. And this time, the Earl of Tyler takes it out across the 25 to the 27-yard line. But he's short of a first down. It'll bring up third down and about two. Don, remember, the purpose for the Oilers right now is to control the ball. There's only four minutes and 23 seconds left. It might have been a blessing that it's now third down and half a yard to go. I think he came up just a little short of the first down. There's a good chance the Bears won't get it back. And if they do, they've only got one timeout, remember. That's right. The Oilers holding to a 10-6 lead. They led this game at the half 7-6. Chicago took the early lead. Sixth thing you see, Gary Fensick, who made the tackle on Campbell, signal over about a foot for them. What are the odds that they go left? Right over Young, Gray, and Pass. has been a second half player he's averaging over six yards a rush this season over 6.2 yards a rush in the second half a little over 4.4 in the first half I'll take either half yeah These great fullbacks seem to get better the more they get the ball as the game wears down and the other people wear out third down a foot for Houston they go to the run they go to Campbell first down and more as Earl Campbell takes it across the 30 out to the 33 yard line and the Oilers get four new downs. Bob Young just ran the defensive tackle right off the line of scrimmage. They've stated so long that uh, Bob Young is probably the strongest one-on-one -on -one blocker in this game. Houston feels it's a godsend that they were able to obtain him. 285 pounds. He might be the strongest player in football, too. They've got Tim Wilson, Carl Bach, Bob Young, all of them. They create a hole. Young's a world-class weightlifter. He says for offensive linemen, the real key is strong legs more than an upper body. Need them both, I think. Here is Campbell coming ahead on first down to the 40, and then a penalty marker goes down at the Houston 41-yard line with 328 left to play, and a hold is going to be signaled against the Oilers. So here's a big development for Chicago. The penalty marker stopping the clock with 328 to play. Houston leading 10-6. 
But instead of an eight yard gainer, the play comes back and Houston will be assessed 10 yards and penalty. Again, that one point looms very large. A four point lead at this point in the game is a lot bigger than a three pointer. They keep good field position, put Chicago down there around their own 20 with only one timeout and two minutes to play, having to go the length of the field. That's having your back up against it. Turnovers have been very limited. Interception for each side in the first half. to about the 33 yard line where Dan Hampton knocked it down and the clock starts up again as the Oilers wanted to they huddle at their leisure now holding to a four point lead the Bears would have to score two field goals or a touchdown to go ahead the Houston Oilers looking to grind the ball out and the clock second down and just over 10 for the first down defensive substitutes now they pull a couple of linebackers Hicks and Buck and Sturm come out some speed in there. Otis Wilson goes in. Pitch back to Campbell, turning the corner. And Campbell, who has great speed to go with his great strength, gets very close to a first down for Houston before Hartenstein and Fensick knocked him down. Many things have been said about a great player like Earl Campbell. There's one of his most popular. Campbell may not be in a class by himself, but it don't take long to call the roll. <laughs> Fifty yards and 27 carries. No receptions, though, unlike Walter Payton, who's caught six. The total yardage of these two great backs is a big factor in the game. And the reason that he hasn't caught any balls is they usually use him as a decoy on a run play fake, taking him out of the pattern. It's third down and two. Power formation for the Oilers. They go to the money back. Campbell. They got there. He barely got there. I don't know if he got there. the ball to the 44 yard line. I don't think he did get there Don. 243 on the game clock. We're in the fourth quarter and Houston leads 10 to 6. I think it's going to be fourth down and I think I think the Oilers will punt. They get it. I'm wrong again. huh? First down Houston. Now let's switch to NFL 80 in New York. We go back again to Brian Gumbel. We're back and set to go now. Houston, 10-6 leader with four new downs. Pitch back goes to Campbell all day long. Earl Campbell crashing ahead. Look at him drive on first down. He gets eight. Down to the 48-yard line of Chicago. And the clock continues to run. 2-12 to play in the game. The Oilers looking to take over sole possession of first place in the AFC Central. As Pittsburgh beat Cleveland today. They're both at 7-4. And the Oilers would go to eight and three with a victory here today. Now the two minute warning is given as Earl Campbell has delivered all day long for Houston. Two minutes to go when we come back. Lots of good ones going on including right here in Chicago. The Jets in Denver are tied and time permitting if this one concludes we'll be going for live action to that game at Mile High Stadium. Fourth quarter Miami now comes back for a second time to take the lead over San Francisco. Don, how big are those two timeouts that the Bears called in the third and fourth quarter in short yardage situations? Right now, if, if the Oilers can pick up two yards, there's nothing the Bears can do about them running out the clock. And when this one concludes, and it's two minutes away from conclusion, we'll also be getting a complete update on NFL 80, the 11th week of play. Highlights from all around the league. It's second down and two for the Houston Oilers. Second back through is Campbell. Hampton gets him, knocks him down. Pretty close to a first down. But you were pointing out, John, the importance of maintaining your timeouts, and the Bears only have one left. Well, very seldom do you see a team get in a situation on fourth down where they go for it all four times and, and call a timeout on each occasion. Uh, those timeouts are to be used in the last part of a close ball game so that you can win it. And I think it's important to try and be a little bit ahead of the game so when you get into that situation, you don't take any time with that play. That's a play you hope you get in a position to be able to call 
And sometimes when you insert different personnel into the ball game, it necessitates you taking a little more time. But I don't think it necessitates you calling a timeout unless there's some confusion. Neil Armstrong was a great player himself. First round draft choice of the Eagles back in 47. Not the Neil Armstrong that's walked on the moon, but he's locked a lot of cold days on Soldier Field in Chicago like this one. Bum Phillips across the way saw his team come out this year with a three and three record after six games. And now with the clock running 136 to play. Bum Phillips and his Oilers are possibly closing in on a fifth consecutive victory and sole possession of first place in the AFC Central. Stabler gives off to Campbell and Earl Campbell takes it in. Look at Earl Campbell. He broke it. Earl Campbell is down inside the 10 and finally Schmidt gets him down at the four yard line. He's only great. <laughs> He's just trying to hold possession of the ball. He goes 48 yards. We've seen him do that so many times throughout his career. This game is history, and there's nothing Chicago can do about it if they just take the ball and fall on it. One minute left to go, and the clock running as the Oilers, after a 48-yard run, Campbell, look at those numbers. 31 carries, 212 yards, his third 200-yard game of this season. I guess it's too bad he hasn't caught a pass, huh? <laughs> I mean, if a man can do everything for a team, you've got to say this man's as important to his group as any one man has ever been to, to any group. Boy, he's so. They are right at the top of the heap. Now they go to the run again. Wilson, you'll remember, was in the end zone with the only touchdown of this game on a similar run after he got a pitch. Actually, he was ruled a pass from Gifford Nielsen, the holder on a fake field goal attempt. Earl's taking a little break here now. He must take him right to the whirlpool. Well, that's it for him because there's only time for one more play. The last time out was just called by Chicago. Sit on the ball and you've got a victory. Our producer here today has been Mike Wiseman, our director, John Gonzalez. We'd also like to thank Sandy Weir, Gil Haggard, Terry Kane, Steve Dans, Dick Bossing. As Kenny Stabler goes to the sidelines, 20 seconds left. What do you do here, John? You sit on the ball, Don't say nice game, in. fellas, and get out of town. I'm very fortunate because I think the Bears were ready to play this ball game. They played very well offensively all day long. I think in critical situations they were beaten, and that's what cost them the ball game. The Earl of Tyler with 212 yards today, 1,306 through 11 weeks of play. This is his career high, 212 yards. He had a previous high of 203. Ronnie Coleman and all the Oilers going over to pay their respects to the, <laughs> the you lead. I think they're a little happy. They know how important this yes, ball sir. game is. They've got one game against, against New York next week, and they've got to win that game to get into a situation to play Pittsburgh and Cleveland and win it all on their own. On the other side of the coin, Chicago's really down. They've got a lot of room to make up, only five games left to make it up in. Yeah, they'll be two games down with five games to play. Minnesota and Detroit atop the AF NFC Central, and the Vikings playing very well lately. So this is how to look at day's end, barring a spectacular turnabout in this game. The Oilers will have a one-game lead over Cleveland and Pittsburgh. Cincinnati shut out today by Buffalo 14-0. The Bills have taken the AFC Eastern leap. As Vince Evans, who had some spectacular moments himself in this game, including that 55-yard run on a broken pass play, 80 yards rushing and four carries. Did about all that could be expected of him. I think he's going to be an outstanding quarterback in the future, and he's a good one right now. The Bears did everything but get the ball in the end zone. Bob Thomas's two first-half field goals accounted for all their scoring, and now the clock winds down. Ten seconds left to go, and the Bears helpless to stop it. As the Oilers stroll out onto the field, and this will be the eighth consecutive, the eighth victory of the season, the fifth in a row for the Houston Oilers, as they defeat the Chicago Bears here at Soldier Field 10 to 6. We'll be back at Soldier Field in Chicago. So the Oilers beat the Bears by a final of 10-6. But on this 11th Sunday, the Bills turned back the Bengals while the Patriots were losing to the Rams. So the Bills have moved into first place in the AFC East. And the Steelers have beaten the Browns, ended their winning streak at five games. We're going to have scores and highlights of Week 11 and live coverage of games still in progress. We'll get to it all on the Budweiser NFL Report following these messages from your local station. Down pass to Lynn Swan, and the Steelers turn back the Browns 16-13 to move once again a contest in the AFC Central. This is the Budweiser NFL Report, brought to you by Budweiser. For all you do, this Bud's for you. 
Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to NFL 80 Studios in New York. I'm Brian Gumbel. This has been a busy Sunday number 11 of this NFL season. We're going to get you caught up on all the scores and highlights, games that have concluded this day. Let's get it started with that ball game we just spoke of. The Pittsburgh Steelers, a winner over the Cleveland Browns today. Final in that ball game, 16-13. Many had been saying the Steeler reign was at an end in the AFC Central, but by beating the Browns, they moved into a tie with one of the co-leaders in that division. Both of them now just a game back, trailing the Houston Oilers, who turned back the Bears to move to an 8-3 record. The Browns and the Steelers now standing at 7-4. This was not a ball game for the timid at Three Rivers Stadium. The Steelers knew they needed a victory, came in and got it before a packed house. Terry Bradshaw got the Steelers on the board first, completing a 10-yard touchdown pass to Jim Smith, moved the Steelers in front by a score of 7-0. But Brian Seif threw a touchdown pass to Ozzie Newsome. And then Dave Logan caught, made a great catch for a 15-yard touchdown strike. Browns were in front 13-7. The Steelers won this ball game, but they did not necessarily outplay the Browns in this day. They did, in fact, commit quite a few turnovers. Watch this one. Franco Harris has the ball stripped from him by Charlie Hall. And Terry Bradshaw threw four interceptions on this day. Here's one of them. Wound up in the arms of Clarence Scott. But the bottom line is the Steelers won it. They were trailing. When Bradshaw rolled out, just 16 seconds left. He was out of timeouts, but he found number 88. Lynn Swan flipped him the ball. And just like that, the Steelers had reasserted themselves in the AFC Central. They're now a game back of the Houston Oilers. The Buffalo Bills have moved into sole possession of first place in the AFC East. At Cincinnati's Riverfront Stadium today, Joe Ferguson, Jerry Butler and company beat the Bengals. Final score in that ball game, 14 0. Been a long year for Kenny Anderson and the rest of the Bengals. Been a good year for Joe Ferguson and the rest of the Bills.